Wednesday, January 24th. I'm your host, Sarah Beal. On today's show, we talk to Deputy Chief Matthew Sonneben of the Barnesville Police Department. We talk Giz Renewal with Planning and Development Director Elizabeth Jenkins. And we'll hear from Finance Director Mark Milne about the recent Government Finance Officers Association Budget Award the town recently received. But first, let's get a look at today's top headlines. Cape Cod Healthcare and the town of Barnesville are partnering to host a blood drive here at Town Hall. This Friday, January 26, from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., the blood mobile will be parked in the Town Hall parking lot. Because of recent bad weather, 35 blood drives have been canceled recently, so the need for blood is high. If you would like to make an appointment, please call 508-862-5663. And of course, walk-ins are always welcome. All blood collected stays right here on Cape Cod. A joint subcommittee of the Town Council and School Committee has selected three candidates to move forward in the search to fill the seat recently vacated by former School Committee member Margo, Chair, uh, Margo Weber. The committee was chaired by Precinct 1 Town Councilor John Flores and includes Town Council President Eric Steinhilber, Precinct 13 Town Councilor Jen Cullum, and School Committee Chair Chris Joyce as well as Vice Chair Stephanie Ellis. The three candidates are Suzanne Conley, Barbara Dunn, and Edith LeBron. They will be interviewed at the February 1st Town Council meeting, which will also serve as a joint meeting with the school committee. A vote that will be taken that night to determine who will be appointed to fill the vacated seat. The Town of Barnesville is currently accepting applications for artists and artisans interested in participating in the 2018 Hyannis High Arts Cultural District Artist Shanty Program. Artist shanties are located in the Hyannis High Arts Cultural District at Bismore Park and new this season, three additional shanties along the walkway to the sea overlooking Azelton Park. Artists will be juried as applications are received and applications are accepted on a rolling basis for the remaining spots for the 2018 season. Spots are filled based on need and availability and applications can be found at www.artsbarnstable.com. Coming up next, Deputy Chief Matthew Sonnebend. Deputy Chief, thank you so much for joining us today. A couple things we want to talk about. The first thing is there was a really fun event uh, held through the HYCC after school program this week, the Kids mm -hmm. vs. Cops Family Feud. And I know you were there. I was there filming it. It was so, so much fun. What did you think of that event yesterday? That was, it was great. Yeah. Um, Patty Machado had mentioned it, and I know Brian worked hard to get that together. And uh, Officer Morrison's been down there a lot at the HYCC. Um, Patty's been bringing kids in for the after-school program, and it just kind of blossomed. It was like a little, a fun little event that uh, the cops and the kids could get together to do, um, and just have fun together and have a little bit of com have a little bit of competition. But you know, not everybody is, um, not all the kids that go down there are um, athletic or whatever. They're not into like necessarily into ice hockey or into basketball, so they don't have like those groups to naturally gravitate towards, and they. You know, they want to do games and they want to do things, but they don't fit into those necessarily those sports groups or they're not really into that. They don't really look in, look to do in that. So right. they came up with this idea to have this um, little bit of a competition styled after the family feud. And you're right, it was fun. It was excellent. I was there and a lot of fun. Yeah, the kids the kids seemed like they had a good time, you know. Oh, yeah. And the, the cops did, you know, didn't let them off easy. Definitely came out the cops ended up winning. <laughs> yeah, well that was, you know, I, uh, that was in question for a while there. Yeah. I was saying, you know, I didn't know whether I should could, you know, kind of sneak out the back door cuz I didn't know if they were going to pull it out. Right. But they did at the last minute. They they did. They did so <laughs> It was, it was a lot good. of fun, so hopefully they can continue to do events like that. I think it's good for the kids to see the police officers in a in a positive situation, so that they have that comfortabil comfortability with them. Yep, you know, and it's and it's it's good for the cops too. You know, you can see that, you know, not not everyone is a bad guy, or mm -hmm. not everyone is you know out there to get you or is a boogeyman. It's it's nice to see the human side of things and to be involved with things like that and as you know as a cop it does kind of recharge your batteries to to be involved with things like that that's great um another thing we want to talk about is there was an interesting arrest last week i'm going to let you go ahead and explain this because i don't know if i could <laughs> uh well it wasn't really an arrest okay. but we got a call that there was a car um in hyannis driving around it looked like he was pulling over another car had flashing lights on the car and um, it looked like a police car, like an old Crown Victoria, and the, the person got out of the car and ran up to the other car and had his hands kind of like pointing like it looked like a gun or something. But he had no gun. It was just like a finger, you know, his fingers. Um, got back in the car, and then the 
two cars left. So obviously people were kind of alarmed. They're like, hey, you know, what are the police doing? What is this? And mm-hmm. we're like, well, it isn't us. So we went down there and found this car. It was you know, like a black old Crown Victoria, um, had a spotlight on it. It looked like a legitimate police car. I mean, as far as there was no markings on it to say police or anything, but it had like lights on it that if you looked at them, look, oh, okay, that could be a police car. And right. it had like prisoner cage in the back not necessarily the cage but the the little bars that are on the windows but i don't think there was actually a cage in there it was just the back seat but it had like these bars on the back window and a spotlight on it so um the officers investigated found out that this young man he was like a high school student or something um was had bought this car somehow um and it put some lights in it they weren't red or blue lights they were like yellow or amber and that this other car that he was pulling over was a friend of his, and they were just messing around and everything, but kind of alarmed the neighbors. Mm-hmm. So we ended up, um, we couldn't arrest him, uh, but we did cite him, and we did, there are other steps we're going through right now, and obviously this is going to have to go to court and hear what the court has to say. But um, it was kind of upsetting to the, it was well, very upsetting to people around the area because they didn't know really what was going on, if this was a legitimate police car or not. Mm-hmm. And as you drive around, and I've, I, I've kind of noticed it over the past little bit here, and it seems I've seen them a little bit more and more lately, is these old police cars, when police agencies, particularly down south, when they get rid of cars, they go to auction and, you know, wholesalers buy them, and they could end up, anybody could buy them. Right. You know, they would buy a real old police car. They remove the lights and they remove the sirens and those things that, you know, and the markings that officially identified as a police car. But, you know, if you look around town, most of the old taxis like Crown Victorias are old police cars. Right. So there are second lives for those police cars. I mean, I wouldn't think I'd want one to show on seeing how we drive cars and how much many miles we put on them and how many hours we put on them. Right. But they are out there. And, you know, just watching the news these days, you do see, it seems like more and more incidents, incidences where people are, like, pretending to be police officers and trying to pull people over, which, you know, can make our job more difficult because we do have, like, detectives and everybody have, like, unmarked police cars, and they might legitimately need to pull somebody over, and it could lead to a problem because now the people getting pulled over don't know whether or not it's a police officer. Right. Which can be real problematic. Yeah, know? impersonating a police officer is never a good idea. No, it is not. No. It is not a good idea. Um, but, however, and a lot of people have been asking this question, you know, why didn't he get arrested? Why just Well, the crime in this state... Um, and each state varies what the crime is and what the person has to do to, to meet the threshold of that crime. And in this state, we have it has to be, the only way we can arrest them for it is if we witness it. Right. So if you just find the car later and it's driving down the street, even though it perfectly fits the description of what people said, you might be able to give the person a ticket or something like that, but you can't necessarily arrest them. Right. So that's how things work out. All right. Well, at least it was just two buddies kind of fooling around. It makes it a little bit better than as if, you know, the when I read about it in the, in the newspaper, it sounded like he just pulled over like a random person. So, um, you no, know, just, it, it, just it, it high didn't sound kids. like, you know, from my information, it, I don't think they were, it was random, but mm-hmm. it was not a good idea no. because it was a residential neighborhood and beyond, you know, they upset other people. Yeah. So it was not something that you should legitimately do. And, you know, it leads to the questions, you know, some people like, well, what do I do if somebody in an unmarked car is trying to pull me over? Right. Well, you know, if it's during the day and if it's a highly populated area, you know, you can pull the car over. Um, you can, if the person comes up to your car, you can ask them for identification. You know, police are supposed to identify themselves. You can ask them if a supervisor can come out because, you know, just kind of cooperate with them, but you keep your window, roll your window, don't roll your window down as far as you have to, mm-hmm. and tell them, you know, I'd like to see a supervisor. You know, if, I, if you're uncomfortable let them know about it and we can get a supervisor out to the scene in most cases um you know if it's at nighttime you can always call your cell phone call the 911 and say i'm being pulled over i don't know if it's a police car or not and they'll send somebody else out and mm-hmm. just to make sure you know there are things you can do i don't necessarily want to advocate just keep driving forever because then you can get yourself into more trouble right um and you know i don't want to give people the idea that it's okay just not to stop but there are things you can do if you use a little bit of common sense and keep yourself safe and you know, if you, if it, chances are, if it doesn't feel right, it probably isn't. So right. just make a, you know, make a few phone calls, pull over in a safe area, a well-lit area, 
And if there's p- other people around, just make sure there's other people around to see what's going on. Right, great. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, I look forward to chatting with you again in a couple weeks. No problem. I'll see you later. Thank you. Bye. Bye. My guest today was Deputy Chief Matthew Sonnebend. Coming up, Finance Director Mark Mill, but first, Planning and Development Director Elizabeth Jenkins. Elizabeth, thank you so much for joining us today. Good morning, Sarah, and a pleasure to be here. Yes. So we're going to continue our conversation. We've been talking about the last time you were in, we were talking about the Giz Renewal. We're going to continue talking about that because it's a very huge project. It is. It's been a big project, and, yeah. and we're getting right down to the end here. So um, just a recap uh, in terms of what we're working on. Uh, the downtown Hyannis Growth Incentive Zone was designated by the town and the Cape Cod Commission in 2006, and uh, that was a 10-year designation with a couple of extensions tacked on. Um, so it's time now, uh, you know, as we do with all good planning uh, processes and regulatory tools, to take another look at that and, and evaluate how it's been working. So, um, again, a growth incentive zone is a, is a tool authorized by the Cape Cod Commission to promote compact, mixed-use, walkable development that's served by uh, public infrastructure like our waters and sewers, and then also community amenities. The idea is that if we're going to grow on Cape Cod, which I think we need to, you mm-hmm. know, we talk about the need for housing and, and jobs and workforce, then we should do that in a way that um, that's sustainable and that, that happens in a manner that can build community uh, here on Cape Cod. So I think we have a really op- exciting opportunity to do that in downtown Hyannis. So uh, the process that we're going through right now is submitting a new growth incentive zone application to the Cape Cod Commission to continue that growth incentive zone designation for downtown Hyannis. Wonderful. It's, I know it's been a huge project and it's been a really help to the area. Um, you're going to have a presentation at the planning board meeting, which, just so everyone knows, it's going to be on Monday, January 29th at 7 p.m. at the Senior Center. At the Senior Center, yeah, we've got some work going on in the hearing room yeah. to upgrade all the equipment there, I'm sure. Yes. Um, <laughs> I'm sure you're very excited about that. So we're going to hold it over at the Senior Center, and this is going to be a, um, a community workshop. We've done kind of a lot of outreach and engagement around putting this application together, but this will be an opportunity to have um, folks really be able to take a look at that application, ask questions, walk through it with town staff, and um, just, you know, we'll take it, certainly any comments that, that folks have, but to, you know, get familiar with that document moving forward, because it is significantly different than what we have in our current application. Um, the, the prior approach that we took with the commission was really thinking about a threshold level of development. So, for example, the obviously the big, um, inc- the big, uh, um, well, incentive of this tool is that it pre-permits development under the Cape Cod Commission. Mm -hmm. So development that would go to the Cape Cod Commission for regulatory review within downtown Hyannis stays local, local review only. So the thinking was that that, um, they would permit a specific amount of development. So our our current application authorizes 600 housing units and 585 square feet of commercial space. Um, But, you know, I think we were off in thinking about that as a goal. (laughs) That's really not our goal for downtown Hyannis, but that's what that application is really focused on are those thresholds so we're going to kind of turn it turn it on its side this time and think about you know what are we really trying to build in downtown Hyannis we're trying to again improve infrastructure and walkability we're trying to stabilize neighborhoods and build long-term coastal resiliency so those are those are the conversations that have been happening um, in preparation for this application and those are the new kind of things that you're going to see being measured in this application so not how much can we build how fast can we build but you know, what's the quality of what we're building and, and again, how are all of these things contributing to community yeah, it in makes, downtown Hyannis. It makes sense after 12 years to kind of make those kinds of changes, to make it fit where we are today as opposed to where we were 12 years it ago. It does, because, yeah, frankly, I mean, again, I think it was it wasn't really accurate to think about those thresholds as a goal, but, um, you know, we've done 120 housing units and about 3,500 square feet of commercial space. So obviously well below the thresholds that were set. So again, giving our community really focusing again on on kind of different goals and measures. And then um, the other big change is that, you know, instead of, of kind of 
doing a regulatory review with the Cape Cod Commission on a periodic basis that, you know, the town's really going to own this application now in perpetuity uh, from here on out. And it'll be our responsibility, um, you know, on a, on a five-year basis and then kind of in a bigger scope on a 10-year basis to go through, examine those goals, examine what kind of programs and, and, and kind of priorities we have and make sure that that we're doing everything that we should be doing um, to support downtown Hyannis. So so it's kind of an exciting change because I think it really kind of um, puts a lot more of that local control in place and I think that's what what communities are really looking for in growth incentive zones. That's wonderful. So let's remind everyone again yep. this coming Monday the 29th of January at 7 o'clock at the Senior at Center. At the Senior Center the planning board is hosting that for us mm -hmm. and then um, we'll actually have a follow-up meeting to that on the town council meeting on Thursday, a joint planning board town council public hearing to review the application um, with the leadership, and eventually, when the you know when the um, when those bodies are comfortable with it, we'll be looking for a vote to forward that application to the Cape Cod Commission. Great. Well, thank you so much for coming in, of course, and uh, talking to us about the GIZ. Yeah. I, I'm sure we'll continue talking about yeah. it as it all goes Absolutely. forward. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. My guest today is Elizabeth Jenkins. She's the director of planning and development here in the town of Barnesville. Mark, thank you so much for joining us today. I want to say congratulations. Um, your budget presentation has been awarded the Government Finance Officers Association Distinguished Budget Presentation Award for the 17th year uh, in a row. So that's pretty exciting. Yes, thank you. It's, uh, it's quite an accomplishment and a team effort to uh, produce a budget document every year that satisfies the criteria of this program, mm -hmm. which includes there's 27 different criteria, uh, 14 of them being mandatory, um, and you have to submit your budget document um, to the GFOA, and they assign three reviewers to look at that budget document, and they could be from anywhere in the United States or Canada. Mm -hmm. And they use the established criteria that the GFOA has put together to evaluate that document um, as to whether or not it should receive this uh, distinguished award that they have. It's the only awards program nationwide um, for government entities to participate in. And, you know, it's designed to encourage governments to create a, uh, a transparent and well, um, uh, the well, constructed document that will lend itself to uh, educating the local citizenry as to how their money is spent. Right. I was looking into it, and it's kind of like it gives you criteria so that, you know, people can understand it. So when they're looking at the budget presentation, it's, it's not just, you know, numbers and not really being able to understand things. Part of it is being, being able to be understood by, you know, regular people like myself. Yeah, exactly. I mean, a lot of people, a typical budget, a lot of people are not going to want to look at. It's mm -hmm. just a bunch of numbers. Yeah. And what, 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 what do they mean? But um, this, the, this program um, forces a community to really think about, what needs to be included in that document so that uh, it can be, uh, there, there's four specific areas that they're trying to get you to develop a document to address, and that is a, a, as a policy document, you know, outlining what your policies are, your financial policies in particular, um, an operations guide so that people can understand the services right down, down to the program levels um, that you provide to the community, a financial plan, um, this is how we're going to pay for these services, and these are the revenue sources we're going to use, and, and here's what the long-term trend and perhaps even a, a look back as to how those revenue sources have trended and any reserves you might use to balance that budget and explain why you might be doing that, as well as a communications device. You know, uh, again, lends itself to uh, communicating to the community um, in a clear and concise way. These are what the priorities for the community are, and this is how we're going to um, address those. That's great, and it's it's so great that it's it's something that's available to anybody. It's on the town website. You can also see, view it at you know the libraries. Um, and it's, if someone is wondering how the town is spending money and and what the town's planning to spend money on, it's a great tool to pick up and really you know look at and understand exactly how it all works. And, yep. and that's that's a testament to to your office, you know, putting this together. And I know this is um, the seventeenth year that the town has received this, so it's you know we're consistently putting out a, a comprehensive uh, document for people to view. 
Yes, it, you know, it's really, I'd have to say, it, I have to say it's a team effort. Mm-hmm. Um, this, you know, we, we get a lot of support from the town council. Um, we get a lot of support from department managers and staff um, because there's a lot of work that goes into producing such a document. And without their cooperation uh, and support to, um, to, do, to participate in a program like this, you know, we, we, we couldn't do it because uh, it, 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 it creates – it's a lot more work to produce a document that, that meets these criteria than it would a typical budget document for a community. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think we, we've seen the benefits of, of implementing this process in our community because I think we do a good job of communicating the priorities – to the community and how we're addressing those and how we're going to pay for those and um, you know the, every year we're looking to improve this document we get we get some good feedback from the reviewers every year for suggestions to, as to how to improve it once you once you get the award you can't just stop there right you know it's not, it's not it's it, if you want to continue to receive this award you have to continue to work on um, enhancing it implementing suggested improvements from the reviewers many of those suggestions may not necessarily address the mandatory criteria, um, but these reviewers are looking at documents all across the country. They're seeing best practices. They're sharing that with you, and which allows you to incorporate some of those into your documents and, and make it a better document. So we're always trying to improve upon it. That, that kind of leads into what my next question was. Where, what are some of the benefits of participating in this program? And that's definitely one of them. That's it, yeah. I mean, yeah. You, you really get... Uh, you know, you get a lot of uh, sharing from your colleagues from across the country as to what they're doing and best practices, and and so you get to uh, exercise, implement, and exercise those best practices, which lead, you know, hopefully to a uh, um, a more understanding of your community, uh, more transparency for your community. Um, you know, even coupled with the open budget website that we run now, uh, you know, people can see how our revenue sources are coming in compared to you know what we budgeted for those revenue estimates as well as where we're spending and, and you know how we're tracking the appropriation spending and making sure that we're staying within that as as well as the capital programs you know with the, the wealth of information we provide in that website for the capital program is one of my favorite parts of that program wonderful now is the is the budget that was presented you know that was awarded this was this the last year's budget this is the fiscal year 2018 budget that oh, we're okay. currently working with. Oh, that's um, great. Yes. So, uh, yeah, after we, after we adopt the budget, we submit it to the GFOA. You have uh, 90 days from the day it's adopted to submit it to the GFOA for their review. And, and so we submitted it uh, soon after the council adopted it back in uh, late May, early June. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so, but it takes time. These, they're reviewing documents, oh, yeah. you know, hundreds of documents that get submitted every year. And we just received a notification back in December that you know, we, were, we were awarded it once again. And then we also participate in the other awards program that they have, which is for the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. That's another whole program that we've been participating in as well, which, again, is you know, it's a team effort. Uh, but to participate in these programs sponsored by this organization, which is the only one nationwide, once again, um, you know, it, it, it helps you address, you know, make sure that you're implementing best practices and that you, you really care about sharing financial information with your citizens. That's wonderful. Mark, thank you so much for joining us today. And congratulations again to you and all of your staff and everyone else here at the town for all of your hard work on the budget. I know that it's an ongoing process and we're, we're right into budget for FY19 right now. So I really appreciate it. And uh, thank you for joining me. I look forward to chatting with you again in a couple weeks. Sure. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks, Mark. Have a Bye. great day. Bye. You too. My guest today is Mark Milne. He's the finance director here in the town of Barnstable. Now let's take a look at this week's community calendar. The 1717 Meeting House will be hosting their second annual Burns Night this Friday. The evening will be spent celebrating the life of noted Scottish, Scottish poet Robert Burns, complete with bagpipes, drums, haggis, and Scottish refreshments. This event will take place this Friday at the 1717 Meeting House at 7 p.m. For more information, please visit 1717meetinghouse.org. There are only two meetings left on this week's schedule. Old Kings Highway Historic District Committee meets tonight at 6.30. They'll meet in the West Barnstable Community Building. And Zoning Board of Appeals meets tonight at 7 p.m. right here at Town Hall in the Selectman's Conference Room. Thank you for joining us today. We'll be back tomorrow with an all-new show. 
On tomorrow's show, we talk with Town Manager Mark Ells, and we'll meet Precinct 1 Town Councilor John Flores. For Barnstable Today, I'm Sarah Beal. Thank you.